Hello, welcome to week six, unit four, other standard libraries. In this unit, I will give you a glimpse into the functionality that's available as part of the standard library in the Python programming language. We will in particular look into two libraries, namely the calendar library and the CSV library. Without much introduction, let's jump into our Jupyter Notebook. So here we are in the Jupyter Notebook and the first library we will have a look at is the calendar library. Let's click on it. I have here the documentation and the calendar library from the Python standard library contains calendar related functions. Let's see what we can do with the calendar library. Using the calendar library, it's for example possible to calculate what weekday a certain day in the calendar was. So I import the calendar library and then I call the weekday function for the 1st of March 2022 and as a result we get a 1. What does this mean? We can have a look at the calendar documentation right now, but we can also use the day name, day name list inside the calendar library to get a proper day name for the date we want to see. So, for example, what day was the 1st of January 2022? And we see it was a Saturday. Yeah? There is a list inside the calendar module which maps the numbers via the index to a weekday name. And using this approach, we could, for, of course, also find out what's the 1st of March, what day of a week this would be, and that was a Tuesday. Was or is a Tuesday, depending on when you watch this lecture. But inside the calendar module, there's a lot of other useful functionality. For example, we can easily, with just one function call, print a calendar for a whole month or even for a complete year to the terminal directly. So here we have a calendar for a whole month, for the month of March, but we can also print a calendar for the whole year of 2022 and see all of the different days of the weeks and uh, their corresponding date. I want to point out something important here. We can actually have a look at the source code of these Python modules, of these Python libraries from the standard library. So I linked to the source code of the Python standard library right here. And let's make this a little bit more bigger. Um, and actually where I want to go is this function. Yeah. And if you have a look at this function, at the print months function, you will see that the Python standard library itself reuses other Python functions. For example, the built-in print. Yeah. So this is just a hint again to what we've shown you earlier about combining functions. I guess that was in week five, if I remember correctly. Um, and also the Python standard library makes excessive use of this approach to reuse functionality inside other libraries, for example. And if you want, you can of course have a look at other methods yourself and see how they are implemented inside the Python language. There's one more thing relating to the calendar library. You might remember from week one, there was a little exercise where you had to calculate if a certain year was a leap year. Before trying to implement such functionality yourself, you should always have a look if there is a functionality available in the Python standard libraries that you can use. And it turns out for calculating the leap year, actually there is. In the calendar module, there is a function called isLeap, which will tell you if a year is a leap year or not. And in the small example here, I use the, this isLeap function to check if a certain year is a leap year or not. And let's give this a try. 
you might remember that 1900 wasn't a leap year, according to the to this definition. So the result is it is false that 1900 is was a leap year. You might also remember that according to the definition, 2000 was a leap year. In this case, our function returns true. And we can also execute this uh, with, for example, 2016, which was also a leap year. So this function, calendar is leap, um, just as a reminder that you should always look first if there's a functionality available in the Python standard library that you can reuse before implementing something yourself. So and this leads us to the second library we will have a look at, the CSV library. Also for the CSV library are linked to the documentation. So the CSV library is a library for reading and writing CSV files. As you might remember from week four, there are different CSV formats. So for example, Microsoft Excel uses a semicolon in a CSV file. Other programs use, for example, a comma in a CSV file. And it can be quite complex to handle all this yourself. And therefore, all these different possibilities to read and write CSV files are abstracted using the CSV library. So using the CSV library, it's very easy to read data from CSV files. In order to do this, we have provided a little CSV file, which is called student Excel. I open this up here that you see the content of this file. You see that this is a CSV file. It contains lots and lots of data, again, of students from Harry Potter. And what I can now do using the CSV library, I can open the file first. We need to open the file. And then I can create a CSV reader using this file. And afterwards, I can read or work with every row from the reader. And you will see when I execute this, that CSV library takes care of all the handling of the file of the data in the file. So for each and every element, you know, I get, for example, here, a list containing the data. So one thing you might have noticed, which is not so nice right now, we have here, so to say, a header line. So the first line in our CSV file basically describes the data. So that's the first element is a surname, second element is a first name, and so on. But also, this functionality is available in the CSV library. So we can use a dictionary reader instead of the reader we just used. And the dictionary reader creates a dictionary for every line in the CSV file, except it uses the first line as the keys for the dictionary. And let's see how this looks. Again, I open the file. Now I create a dictionary reader, and after that I can work through all the elements in this dictionary reader, and let's see how they look. You see, right now we get for each and every line of our input file a dictionary which maps, for example, the surname, the first name, or the mail address two different elements of a dictionary. So it's very easy right now to, for example, get the surnames of all the elements in our list. Uh, we could go through it row by row and just select the element surname. So if we actually look at the documentation of the dict reader, we see that there is just one required parameter, which is a file. But there are different other parameters, in particular, for example, the dialect parameter, which has certain default values. The default value for the dialect parameter is Excel. So that was the reason why our reader was able to immediately work with the Excel file, with the Excel CSV file. There are different dialects, different versions, and that's what you can use a dialect um, 
dialect argument for if you have a different kind of CSV version, you can still work with it using the dict reader, only you have to specify the correct dialect. Which different dialects are available? You can have a look at the documentation and it will describe what are the properties of these different dialects. Then what we do in this little program just to work with a CSV library a little bit more, we again read using a dict reader our student file and afterwards for each and every student we you know, delete the matriculation number after reading it and create another dictionary where we map now the matriculation number to the dictionary of students. And if we execute this, uh, we get something which is not very readable, but what you see in here is, for example, that this matriculation number is mapped to Harry Potter. Uh, that's the entry of Harry Potter. And we removed the matriculation number from the student record. So this is similar to the, the approach we took in week three, unit two, uh, just to, to show you this once again. But using the CSV library, it's not only possible to read data from CSV files, but also to write data to CSV files. And this is what we will be doing next. We will be using the CSV library to write CSV data. And how do we do this? We use, again, our students from earlier, so the Harry Potter characters, and then we ask the user for a few matriculation numbers, in this case five, we do this five times, and for each and every matriculation number that the user enters, we will later on read this data from our dictionary and write it to a file using a dict writer. So the dictionary writer is down here, we have to define which file we need to write to and open it. That's up here. We open a file, give it as a name, and of course we need to open it for writing. Then we specify which field names we want to write to the file. And then we create our dictionary writer that takes the output files and the field names and later on, we can just provide a dictionary of students and the dict writer will take care of writing this data to a file. So what I will do right now, I will comment this in so that we see what's happening inside the program. Um, and I need to look up some matriculation numbers first. Um, let's use, for example, 412620. Execute this, 412610, I guess. Uh, let's try some more. I don't know which matriculation numbers are present in our list. So I just enter a few. Uh, and I didn't get any data. <laughs> so that's what's why I'm expecting. So let's copy over a correct matriculation number. Execute this once again. We just use that one all the time. And sure enough, we get Harry Potter, only Harry Potter. So we would now expect that to this file, some students only the data of Harry Potter is written five times. Let's check this out. I reload here. We see we have now a new file, some students. And if we open this file, we see only Harry Potter in it. And especially what's important that only the fields we wanted to write, namely the surname, the first name, and the email address have been written. And all of this was possible by just using the dictionary writer, dict writer from the CSV library. So let's switch back to our slides. What have you learned in this unit? In this unit, I gave you a little overview of other libraries, other than the MAST library, 
um, namely the calendar and the CSV library. We have played around with a little of the functionality in these libraries. Actually, already in these libraries, there's much more functionality. And if you look in the Python standard documentation, you will find even more libraries with lots and lots of additional functionality. So what I showed you in this unit, it's just a small glimpse um, I really encourage you to have a look at the Python documentation and see which kind of functionality is available. Thanks for watching and see you in one of the following units.